into the fires of battle, unto the anvil of war. That is what we say. As the sun sets, I stand on the battlements, and I watch for the first sign. I do not wait long. They crest the horizon, the darkness of night ablaze with their advent. They all carry torches, burning bundles of wood. It lights the night like a snake of fire as they rush toward us. The orc column will be here within the hour. The snake of light, of fire, reminds me. It reminds me of the trenches of lava flows that come from the volcanoes of my homeworld, Nocturne. It reminds me of why I am fighting. It reminds me of my forge, my place, my kith, my kin. It reminds me of a joyous day they had waited. They think I do them honor, but it is I who is honored. I walk into their home, the home of the sons of my father, the daughters of my mother. Though this has not literally been true for hundreds of years, they still will crest my presence, for we are family. Most of our cousins, the other Astartes, do not know this warmth, do not permit their number to attain these ties. They know not what they sacrifice, for they sacrifice purpose. I stoop to pass the door. I wear not my panoply of war, my armor, my weapons. I wear my robes, the robes of the cult of Prometheus. Yet, despite my similar attire, we do not look alike. I tower over all, yet none flinch or retreat from my presence. I am met with reverent bows out of respect, but all the faces that raise to meet my eye are adorned with the glory of light, of smiles. The warmth of family beams from them. It bathes me. It heals me. It makes me stronger than any of my cousins can fathom. They lose so much. They never have this. The ritual is short. I fear that it is almost being rushed, yet I know why. It is the mighty lungs of the newest fire in our hearth, the new life for which we gather here to give thanks, to welcome into our family. He is strong. The smile is wide from all, but there is also a mild twitch. His endurance is good. He is loud and tenacious in signaling his displeasure. He shouts like a warrior born, crying his loudest at their disruption to his quiet, at being passed from one to another, so they may look in his eyes. I try not to smile, as I must play my part. And hence is he passed to me. My hands engulf him like a mountain swallows a careless climber. He is large for his age. I raise him up to me to look in his eyes as our family ritual demands. All look on now, but with a hushed awe as a child looks into my eyes and stops. His tears cease and his features take on a calmness I can only recognize when I look in a mirror. He reaches for my finger and squeezes it, and then, like a blessing that washes away the awe on each face and replaces it with the heat of love, the smiles are infectious as the tiny bell of his laugh chimes throughout this gathering place. But he is as ardent in his joy as he was in his previous consternation, all begin to laugh, even me. But then I notice it, when he closes his eyes and opens them. For a fleeting second, I saw a tinge of red. 
an omen. I do not believe in such things usually, but it all adds up. He snuggles into my hands and begins to drop off, but I saw it. Now I must do something I have not done in three generations of my family. Usually I would possess toward the mother. I would pass back the child as I have done so many times. I would say nothing and they would know I had given my blessing, had accepted the child into our family, but not so today. I stride, making a course between them at first, but at the last I move toward the father. All now look on in silence, in awe again. It has been so long. I approach the father, his eyes now wide as he looks up at me. In his shock, he almost forgets to open his arms to accept back his son. As I bend down to pass this most precious treasure back to his sire, I speak the words, the words our family have always used, the words that were said when I was passed back to my own father so many years ago. I speak. His soul is strong, perhaps strong enough for two hearts. The father nods and looks into his son's face with a newfound reverence. The mother's eyes tear up, a mixture of fear and pride in equal measure as she moves to her husband's side to bask in the vision of her now slumbering son. Perhaps she fears, but when she looks up at me, she pretends the tears are ones of pride and joy. I will never know for certain if she pretends or no, I am only a man. For I have told them what I saw. Maybe, maybe he will be strong enough to pass the trials. Maybe he will be strong enough, determined enough, brave enough to join my order to be a son of Vulcan, to be a salamander. My eyes open again and the greenskins are almost here. I check my bolter, I check the flamer at my feet, for the number that approaches means that no matter how fast we fire, no matter how accurately hit our lines, they will, for they are many and we are few. But I swear to myself, as I always do, I look to the village behind and below me and I swear None shall pass my watch, for I stand between the greenskins and brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. Though this village be light years from my home, though they knew me not but scant hours ago, they will never know or remember my name. These are my people, all of them. They are humans. They are brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. We are the same. Were the entire Xenos race to attempt to come crashing down on our lines, we will not break. For we are sons of Nocturne. We are the sons of Vulcan. We are the sons of the Emperor. But more than anything, even than that, we are sons of humanity. As I stand in this place, I hear again that chime, that little bell, the laughter of the youngest of my family. For him, no green skin will pass me this night. Welcome, gentle listeners. I am Baldemort, and I wish to introduce you to the forces and factions of the Weimar 40k universe. Today, I would like to expose a hidden truth, one that is disregarded or ignored by almost the entire community of the Warhammer fanbase. Anyone who has heard of Warhammer will know one of the most repeated tropes. There are no heroes in the grim darkness of the future. 
Alas, I cannot agree with this analysis. For of all of the Adeptus Astartes, of all of the lesions of the Emperor, all of the subsequent chapters from which they sprang, there is one order, one chapter, that stands alone in the Imperium. The Salamanders. To this fraternity of warriors there is one pledge, one oath, that stands above all others. The Space Marines have always been likened to indomitable and brave futuristic knights who swear fealty to the master of mankind. They pledge to protect his realm, his Imperium. They pledge to show honor and courage in the face of their enemy, no matter how terrible in power or visage. They pledge to know no fear. But of all of the classical neo-heraldric pledges that are given, these mighty warriors, the Salamanders, take one their brothers do not. The pledge that separates them from their cousins in other chapters and legions. One that makes them more than their comrades in arms. For it gives them a nobility that is rarely spoken of, as it seems to fly in the face of the popular trope. They are the closest thing that this setting has to true heroes. For this pledge they adhere to above all others, no matter the cost. They pledge to protect the weak. The chapters, rightly or wrongly, see things on a grand scale, the bigger picture. It is this excuse that is used when they ignore the predations of the local population by the Pirate King, the Elder Corsair, the Orc Raiders, the Chaos Invasions, the Demonic Attacks. When any other chapter of Space Marines is faced with an enemy, they will use this excuse to charge into them, to bombard them, to take the heads of their leadership in a decapitating strike, all the while ignoring the plight of the very humans that make up the Imperium, the very thing or marines have been oath-bound to protect. They deploy the same excuse, the same justification. The chapters of Space Marines, the Astartes, are to destroy the enemies of mankind. They are to reduce overall casualties by removing the threats. If a million human beings are to die in a siege, this is a numbers game. It is a drop in the ocean. Other chapters will state that by sacrificing the millions in a hive to being bait for the destruction of the threat, no matter what it may be, that they safeguard all others the enemy would slay. The losses are acceptable in the bigger, grander scheme of things. They feel righteous. But they merely deploy this excuse to shroud their utter disregard, their implicit and callous contempt and nonchalance at the loss of normal human life. It is not difficult to see why. The vast majority of Space Marines cut off all ties to their family, their homeworld, and normal humanity. They remove these ties as they state will, they will be distractions, will muddy waters, and will cause conflicts of priority and remove the perspective that is required for the Astartes to view the greater whole. But the Salamanders do not believe this, and do not do this. For the Salamanders are, are one of the only chapters that keep families and culture and love at the very heart of their endeavors, always at the forefront of their minds. A Salamander is permitted to maintain contact with his family, is encouraged to take whatever scant time they may be given to be with their loved ones, their normal human kith and kin. Not for the Salamanders is the numbers game, the bigger picture, for they believe that they are the very center of their families, the very center of the human race, and they will defend any and all. A salamander would never abandon convoys of civilians to the ravages of a horde of greenskins, simply to strike at a war boss, as was clearly shown on Armageddon, much to the chagrin of their allies. The salamanders do not consider the loss of even one single life to be acceptable if it can be avoided. They would stand and hold the line, would fight with the same fervor and implacable rage to defend the smallest shanty town of huts as other chapters would the very gates of the Imperial Palace on Terra. The Salamanders never forget that they are, above all things, human. Something that all too often their brothers parrot and profess, but do not seem to actually believe. Not really. Not in their hearts. Their goal is the destruction of their enemies, with the saving of human lives as almost an afterthought, a convenient byproduct. They live for the fray. Not all, but most. 
Not so the Salamanders. And always has it been this way. The Salamanders, the 18th legion of the Legionis Astartes, were ever a legion who were willing to sacrifice and be sacrificed for others. Indeed, they are, in the opinion of this bard, the most noble of all of the Space Marines. Originally, they were dubbed the Fire Dragons. In the end stages of the Unification Wars, they were almost wiped out. For they were sent into a battle that most thought they would never return from at all. The entire 20,000 warriors of the 18th Legion were to be used in one assault. An impossible task, from which only 1,000 of them returned. But return they did. The assault of the Tempest Galleries. A battle that has resounded through history. The Caucasus Wastes was the last remaining rogue state that had not bent the knee to the Emperor in his campaign to unify Terra, Earth. They had shielding that was impossible to be brought down, so the Emperor, in his wisdom, located the source by which these shields were powered. It was far underground, almost impossible to reach. The 18th were sent via vast digging torpedoes into the caverns under the city-states of the Caucasus Wastes, the Tempest Galleries. None truly expected them to be victorious. None truly believed any would return, but they were wrong. The Salamanders fought a battle so important, an adversary so terrible, I needs must come back to this at another time to do it proper justice. They went knowing they may be sacrificed for the greater goal, the unification of Holy Terror, the birthplace of humanity. Earth. But importantly, they went without complaint. They went not as lambs to the slaughter, but as men with heads held high. They did the impossible. They brought down those impenetrable shields and permitted six other legions and the Emperor's own bodyguards, the 10,000, the Custodes, to sweep into the site of the last resistance and crush it all. Their actions sealed the end of that terrible war and permitted the domination and unification of Terra. But they did one thing none believed they could. They came back. Out of 20,000 sent, a mere thousand returned. Forever after were their numbers fewer than their brother legions. But a legion they did eventually become again. When this was achieved, it was most often that the Salamanders were kept as a strategic and tactical reserve by the Emperor's armies during the Great Crusade. They would be sent to defend worlds that had been brought into compliance that were threatened, but too far from the front to have the crusading legions turn about in time. They became known as the Defenders of Humanity, as they intercepted raiders, crushed unforeseen orc incursions, or any threat that occurred behind the lines of the crusade as it pushed further and further out into the galaxy. It has been a mantle that they have worn with pride. It has been one that they have worn over all of the 10,000 years of the Imperium, never slipping, never dropped. For the Salamanders will defend humans, no matter the cost to themselves. While most other chapters will always weigh up the benefit and loss of their intervention, will always balance their losses to the damage done to the Imperium before intervening, the Salamanders do not. They will stand. They will attack. They will burn, they will fight to the bitter end in the defense of the common human as no other. The Salamanders are still Astartes, are still space marines, are still things of fire and wrath, and built and trained, equipped and programmed for one thing only. War. But of all of the legions, of all of the chapters, they are the only ones I can honestly say deserve the title of Knights. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. If you have enjoyed this introduction to the Salamanders, then please do consider liking and subscribing. If you are a regular gentle listener, then please do also consider supporting us on Patreon. If this is not possible, then perhaps just a share. I would like our tribe to grow, shall we say. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo.